Hi everyone, so welcome to the live stream today and welcome to a brand new week as we continue with our discussion for the March 2024 examination. We are in the seventh week generally. It means that we have about six give and take or five weeks to go for the March 2024 examination and we are officially starting with our ifrs master class for the discussion in respect of the accounting standards because remember when it comes to corporate reporting and financial reporting your ability to pass these papers will depend on your understanding of the accounting standards and it is for this reason why we are going to be hosting this ifrs masterclass to help you so that you can really understand the way the standards are the key issues that you have to focus on to position you to pass the examination and I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. We are looking at IAS 39 today, and that is IAS. Did I say IAS 39? Sorry, IAS 33. That is earnings per share. It's one of the fundamental accounting standards that the examiner is going to be getting excited about coming in March 2024 that we need to know about. So on the stream today, we want to begin the discussion in respect of this particular accounting standard. So if there are any questions you have for me or some accounting standards that you would want me to cover on the channel, you can leave it in the comment section or the chat box. But for the most part, it is likely that we have partly covered some of the things that you may be asking about so you can check the playlist on the channel or the podcast on the channel the ifrs masterclass podcast on the channel because we've covered a number of the standards in previous sessions and that will help you to study prepare well for the examination and most importantly pass the exam so welcome let me bring up my screen and then let's really get excited into the discussion real quick as we go into ias 33 earnings per share right so what is earnings per share about what is is 33 about it is what it says it is i mean what else do you need so is 33 earnings per share okay we're gonna really be talking about eps earnings per share you know at the end of the year companies are going to be making profits after tax and so it is important we identify the profits that the entity has made for the year how much of that profit will be given or attributable to the shareholders in other words if we should distribute the profit for the year how much will each shareholder get that is what we mean by and in spare share but there is a catch on that so make sure you stay with me carefully as we unwind the principle so just some few thoughts in respect of theoretical issues that we need to understand when it comes to the ias 33 so let's look at some few key definitions and then we can open up the discussion so and in spare share is the measure of the amount of profit earned by a company for each ordinary share for each ordinary share so how much profit that we have earned when we distribute it how much will be attributable to each share ordinary share that is what we mean by the earnings per share so basically it means that our earnings per share eps it's going to be the patterns i'm going to explain what the heck that is in a moment divided by wins patterns divided by wins so what is patterns patterns is simply profit attributable to equity shareholders profit attributable to equity shareholders That is what patterns is, profit attributable to equity shareholders. Now, stay with me carefully, because when we say profit attributable to equity shareholders, what exactly do we mean by that? This is what we mean by profit attributable to equity shareholders. We, go we are going to pick the profit of the tax for the year. Okay, profit of the tax. And if it happens that the entity has preference shareholders, then dividend paid to the preference shareholders will be less. So we less dividend to preference shareholders. 
Now, the reason is that, you know, dividend to preference shareholders will not be treated in the profit or loss account. They don't affect the profit. They are rather treated in the statement of changes in equity. So they wouldn't affect the profit for the year generally in that regard. So we're going to be lessing dividend that we are going to be paying to the equity shareholders and because it wasn't treated in the p l account we have to subtract it from the profit after tax then if it happens that we are in a consolidated financial statement environment then we have to also less dividend to non-control non-controlling interest nci non-controlling interest this is if we are in a consolidated financial statement environment so when we less these out, that is what gives us the earnings attributable to the equity shareholders, parties. Because the equity shareholders are the actual owners of the organization. So we want to find out the actual owners of the company, when we distribute the profit of the entity, how much will they get? That is why we deal with profit attributable to equity shareholders profit attributable to equity shareholders that's very important that's very important the second thing is going to be the wins wins is simply number of weighted average number of equity shares weighted average number of equity shares Now, it is important you note that not all shares will qualify for earnings within a year. The reason is that possibly during the year, the entity may issue new shares, maybe midway in the year. Or the entity may do bonus issue midway in the year. The entity may do right issue midway within the year. Now, when this happens, you cannot say that a shareholder who was having shares at the beginning of the year will have the same earnings as a shareholder who bought shares in the middle of the year. It's not fair to do that. That's not right. Hence, we are going to be dealing with the weighted average number of equity shares. And we're going to be coming into that because we are going to be applying the principles individually. And under each of the principles that we are going to apply, we are going to be picking weighted average number of equity shares in a very interesting manner. So stay with me. So that is our opening issue that earnings per share is a profit attributable to the equity shareholders divided by the weighted average number of shares weighted average number of equity shares but the question we ask ourselves is why is it important for us to calculate the earnings per share and then number two what are the limitations of the earnings per share yes it is important what are the limitations so i'm going to be coming in from my slide this is actually from my book on corporate reporting or financial reporting so in case you have my book this is coming i'm coming in from my book generally in this case so a couple of things quickly first let's talk about limitations one any spare share does not take into consideration inflation so when we are calculating the earnings per share for an entity to describe that okay this is how much shareholders are going to be getting we don't consider inflation time value of money we don't care it's just that okay if you had this earnings and we are going to be calculating diluted earnings per share we're just going to be doing the all the calculation just in today's term without considering inflation and that is a limitation two it is basically based on historical information yes any spare share is what has happened in the past. Okay, so from January to December, if our year ended is 31st December, January to December, this is the earnings we have made. So based on that earnings, this is how much is attributable to each ordinary share. Does it tell us what's about the future? Hell no. Now, that historical information is also subject to a lot of manipulation, creative accounting, uh, and then window dressing by management. So management can actually manipulate the data a lot in calculating the earnings per share. So yeah, it could be a good indicator to tell shareholders how much they are going to be getting or they are like they are getting for the year based on the profit that is attributable to them. But 
it is based on historical information and does not really consider what is going to happen in the future next any spare share is directly affected by the adopted accounting policy and estimate that is what i just talked about because the accounting policy and accounting estimate is going to influence the earnings per share. If, for instance, an entity decides that a certain expenditure that they incur, based on management discretion, because there is room for a, 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 a number of discretion, they want to capitalize it rather than writing it off in the financial statement, then the earnings is going to go up. That's accounting policy. The entity may decide to change the depreciation policy or increase the economic useful life of the asset. So they can change their depreciation policy or increase the uh, economic useful life of an asset. When they do that, less amount of depreciation will be charged. When less amount of depreciation is charged, it means profit is going to be overstated and we will report higher earnings generally. So there's a lot of manipulation, but hey, what, what else are we going to do? then the last thing is that the earnings per share is not a cash flow profit is not the same as cash flow i hope you've heard that before profit is not cash flow so an entity can record an accounting profit and say oh during the year we recorded a profit of da 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 you prepare their cash flow statement or you look at their cash and cash equivalent and realize they, are, they have a huge bank overdraft which is a current liability. So, yeah, earnings is, earnings is good. Potentially, this is what you are going to get. But that is not cash flow because cash flow is an essential indicator for the survival of a company. Because if we want to find out how an entity can expand and grow, how an entity can survive into the future, earnings per share is not a good indicator. Money, cash is skin, is a better indicator generally. So these are... A couple of limitations that we can use generally when it comes to dealing with the earnings per share in this particular discussion. Any questions, you put it in the chat for me or the comment session for me. I'm going to be reading all your comments. I'm going to be reading all your questions. So if you have anything, please don't hesitate. Put it in the comment session for me or the chat box for me. I see some of you guys joining. We are doing IAS 33, starting off with our IFRS masterclass. If you are getting some value, which I know you are getting, give us a thumbs up on the video. But most importantly, share the video. Let's reach as many students as possible who will need the this particular lecture and other videos available on our channel so we can together reach many students and assist a lot of people because that is my goal to be able to provide this all these videos available to students across so we can help students understand what they are studying go to the exam or and pass the examination so sharing the video you are helping us to reach a lot of people and that is how we will be able to together become successful so if you are getting some value make sure you share the video and let's reach as many students as possible so importance of earnings per share it is a more accurate indicator of the profitability of the entity it is a more accurate indicator of the profitability of the entity yes because you know we are going to be calculating when you are looking at profitability of an entity you are going to be using ratios right so you use things like asset turnover return on capital employed net asset mar uh, profit gross prof profit margin now all of those things can help us to assess the profitability of the company though but hey to shareholders that's what they're looking for so it's a more accurate indication too it indicates the amount of dividend the entity is likely to pay definitely because all other things being equal if the earnings per share is high then you expect that the dividend will also be high now remember that is a little relative because sometimes an entity may make earnings per share of say twenty dollars but then they will pay out a dividend of just two dollars why because they have a higher percentage of retention of profit so that they can reinvest and expand the business and grow the future earnings of the entity so that is not an absolute statement however the earnings per share sort of informs us about how much dividend shareholders are likely to get and there are sometimes an entity can make earnings per share of say ten dollars but it will pay dividend per share of say twenty five dollars 
Why will that happen? Sometimes that happens, which means the entity is paying dividend from previous reserves. Okay, so probably there are no more future things that the entity is seeking to do. So they would rather want to distribute the money to the shareholders. So that is why I said that point is not an absolute point. Nonetheless, the higher the dividend per share, all other things being equal, the the higher the earnings per share, all other things being equal, the higher the dividend per share. Then it is easy to under to be understood by non-financial expert. Earnings per share is direct. Okay, it's very easy to understand. Unlike asset turnover, I mean, if you are looking at asset turnover, you're going to look at the sales divided by capital employed. And in the calculation of the capital employed, there are a lot of things that go into the calculation of the capital employed. If you are looking at Rosie, re, uh, profit before interest and tax divided by capital employed, again, there is a lot of things. And so for non-financial experts on the average, boom. They can see their earnings. All right, this is how much I am going to likely to make from the investment that I made in this company. That's good. That's bad. Then they can make their decision. So it is easy to be understood by non-financial expert. That is why when you see many companies, especially listed companies, at the bottom of their statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, you will see the earnings per share calculated, both the basic earnings per share and the diluted earnings per share, which is something we're going to be getting into in a moment. But these are the theoretical discussions that we need to understand. It is important, but also it has some limitations. It is important, but it has some limitations. So let's go. How do we then calculate the earnings per share? Earnings per share can broadly be divided into two categories. So we have what we call the basic earnings per share and then the diluted earnings per share. The way I want you to understand this in a simple term is that the basic earnings per share is what is actually happening now. It is the current earnings of the entity based on current conditions okay so it is what is happening now that is the basic earnings per share what is happening now today based on current year what is happening now the diluted earnings per share is about potential so that is what is likely to happen in the future okay so it is a hypothetical calculation of the earnings per share so it's a potential it is possible the future what is likely to happen in the future and we're going to be coming back into that in a moment now under the basic earnings per share there are three different scenarios that can come up number one is issue of shares at full market price so during the year when an entity issues shares at full market price, how do we calculate the basic earnings per share? We're going to get into that. Don't worry. Number two, bonus issue. Bonus issue is the issue of free shares to existing shareholders. It's just about converting reserves into share capital. So when an entity makes a bonus issue, what is the tax sorry <laughs> what is the uh, basic earnings per share how do we calculate it we're going to come back to that in a moment then number three is going to be right issues now whilst bonus issue is the issue of free shares to existing shareholders meaning they won't pay anything for the additional shares that they are getting right issue is the issue of new shares to existing shareholders at a price below the current market value what does that mean it means that if the current share price is five dollars per share in the right issue we are issuing them new shares but they're going to pay like three dollars per share and we're going to come to that how we're going to be dealing with that so these are the three key scenarios that can create or that can cause us or influence the calculation of the basic earnings per share under the diluted earnings per share where we are talking about the potential we are going to also have three things two things coming up 
uh, sometimes three things if we want to though but two things broadly and that is share options we're going to get into this in a moment don't worry and the second thing is going to be issue of convertible or not these are the two things that will really bring about dilution in the earnings spare share but there is an, an additional one like i said that is not really dilution but if there is you know convertible preferences convertible preferences and i'm going to explain why i'm saying that that one doesn't create a dilution that much in a moment so these are the two things basic earnings per share what is happening currently based on current conditions diluted earnings per share the hypothetical the future the potential what is likely to happen in the future for the purpose of my presentation this afternoon i'm going to be starting from the diluted earnings per share angle because it's an interesting area that is where we're going to be having a lot of fun coming in so i'm going to be starting from the diluted and in special angle so like i said diluted and in special is simply where we are looking at the potential of the fact that number of shares are likely to change so the first thing we need to ask ourselves is okay if diluted and in special is about potential it's about what is likely to happen in the future it means that our diluted and in special will be equal to the parties, profits attributable to equity shareholders, definitely, divided by the wins. I want you to stay with me here carefully because under diluted earnings per share, it's likely we're going to be adjusting the numerator for the denominator, whether I like it or not, it's going to be adjusted always. But the numerator is not going to be adjusted always, and I'm going to explain that to you in a moment. So, a couple of things we need to understand as well will be to talk about the issue in respect of the potential ordinary shares. Because diluted and in special is what is likely to happen in the future. So, what, what, what we are saying here is that currently your earnings could be $2 per share. But we have given share options to the management of the company. We have issues we issued convertible financial instruments, convertible bond. Now, they may not convert or they may not exercise the option. We don't care. But we want to calculate the earnings per share assuming they have converted at the beginning of the year. That is where the potential ordinary share comes in. So, when we talk about potential ordinary share, it is simply a financial instrument that may entitle a holder to ordinary shares. Let me give you some one-liner here. Potential ordinary share refers to a financial instrument or other contracts that may entitle its holders to ordinary shares at some time in the future. That is potential ordinary shares. Key word here is potential. Because remember, I told you under diluted earnings per share, what are we dealing with? Potential. Okay? What are we dealing with? Something in the future. But we are going to be bringing that potential, something in the future, to the present. And assume that what we think will happen in the future has already happened. Hence, this is the implication of it. That is why we are dealing with potential ordinary shares. Now, IS33 identifies three key 
circumstances under which there could be potential ordinary shares, which will become the basis for our calculation. The first one is debt or financial liability that are convertible into ordinary shares. So when an entity issues convertible loan note, what does that mean? It means that although I am a bondholder, I'm regarded as a creditor of the company, the bond I have gives me the right to convert it into ordinary shares at some time in the future. So when it is time for the redemption of the loan, I can decide and say, hey, management, I don't want my money. Give me some shares. Why? Because it's a convertible financial instrument. Two, share warrants and options. Like I said, options are usually like a golden handcuff. I'm going to expand on that in a, in a moment. Given to the management of the company, sometimes in order for them to remain within the organization for a number of years so that they can exercise that option later. We'll come to that in a moment. And then shares that will be issued upon the satisfaction of certain conditions resulting from contractual arrangements such as the purchase of a business or other assets. So that is the third category. So these are the three issues about potential ordinary shares. So it could be a debt instrument that is convertible into shares. It could be share warrant or share options. Or it could be a contract that an entity has entered into which means that if someone satisfies a certain condition, the person will receive some amount of shares. These three things create the avenue for dilution in the earning spare share. Now, you did chemistry back in high school. When we say something is diluted, it means its concentration reduces. So when we say diluted earning spare share, it means our earning spare share may be reduced as a result of these potential ordinary shares coming into the picture. That's the idea about that. And we're going to be expanding on this throughout my presentation today. So stay with me. So now that we know the idea about the potential ordinary shares, let's now take them one after the other and share some thoughts on them generally in the discussion. And we're going to be starting with the convertible loan notes. So number one, convertible loan notes. Stay with me. Now, convertible loan notes means the holders of the loan notes have the right to convert the loan note into equity shares on the date of redemption. Okay? Or upon maturity. Now, convert Ah, but we want to let the current shareholders know about what will happen if these convertible loan notes holders convert. That's the idea here. So under the convertible loan note environment, our diluted earnings per share, it's going to be equal to Profit attributable to equity shareholders, which is definitely going to be adjusted, divided by the weighted average number of equity shares. Again, that is also going to be adjusted. Now, stay with me. This is the principle. The principle here is that we are assuming, so just some assumptions to make us work. We are assuming that the convertible bondholders have converted at the beginning of the year. Okay? So, bondholders have converted into equity shares at the beginning of the year. That's the first assumption. So we are assuming that although the bond will be redeemed in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time, we are assuming that at the beginning of the current year, they have converted. Okay. 
if they have converted into equity shares what happens it means we will no longer pay the interest on the loan notes so we add back to profit the interest payment so we won't pay them they are interest why because they have converted into equity shares but remember interest is tax deductible so it means since we are not paying them the interest we will lose the tax benefit so third we're gonna less the tax benefit from the interest that is the idea and this is what we are going to be thriving with generally when it comes to dealing with the issue about convertible shares sorry convertible loan notes so we assume bondholders are converting at the beginning of the year number two if they have converted we will no longer pay them the interest so since the interest was deducted in arriving at a profit we are going to add back the interest now since we are not paying that interest it means the tax benefits on the interest also we're not going to get it so we subtract that that is the principle that is the principle okay so let's bring up an illustrative question here and look at it i have some pieces of questions that i'm going to be throwing at you give me a sec thought i had pulled that up already let's see let's see let's see let's see let's see let's see financial reporting and in space share okay so i have some pieces of questions here okay this one it's a very simple question so you can just take a screenshot of it let me throw it into my slide so i don't want to have to go back and forth now stay with me carefully here anytime we are dealing with diluted earnings per share the first thing we do is to calculate the basic earnings per share so let's read this abc plc has 1 million 1 pound ordinary shares and 1100 pounds 10% convertible bond for simplicity we assume it is issued at par now bonds can be issued at par meaning that they're going to be issued at say 100 Ghana city or 100 pounds or 100 100 euros or 100 naira okay meaning it's issue at par so whatever currency you are dealing with boom you go with it hundred dollars you go with that sometimes it could be issued at a discount okay so that will be below the nominal value that will be below the nominal value so if it is whatever issued price is given or the nominal value is given we're going to be using that generally but just for simplicity purposes and we are starting with this we're just going to be dealing with the fact that it is issued at par which is going to be 100 generally each convertible each convertible into 20 ordinary shares on demand okay all of which have been in issue for the whole of the reporting year abc limited share price is 4.50 pounds per share and earnings for the period are Three thousand pounds the tax applicable to the entity is 21 percent so this is an illustrative question that we want to look out for uh, this question was sourced from a note by uh deloitte so we're just using it to bring out the illustration now how do you know it's a diluted and in spare share question we know it's about diluted and in spare share why because there is convertible loan notes so there is diluted and in spare share but before we calculate the diluted and in spare share it is always important we look at a basic and in spare share what is currently happening so that's profit attributable to the equity shareholder divided by the number of equity shares 
Now, sometimes we can multiply this by hundred dollars, hundred Ghana City, hundred to get the amount or the value in the smallest unit of the currency. Sometimes. So the main formula that I gave <coughs> here, the formula that I gave here, we could multiply it by hundred. It's not hundred percent. It is hundred Ghana City, hundred dollar, hundred pounds, uh, whatever, hundred naira because you want to get the answer in the smallest unit of the currency not always is that applicable but if you want you can do that as well in your presentation slide and i'm going to show you that so let's calculate the basic and space here that's pretty simple here uh we don't have a lot going on so we just bring in the five hundred thousand pounds divided by the number of ordinary shares one milli and let's see what we get oh that should be 0 0.5 dollars or five hundred one thousand yeah no 0.5 dollars So that will be the earnings per share in dollars. Now, stay with me. If we want to get that in the smallest unit of the currency, then we could multiply that by $100. And that will give us the answer in 50 pence. That was what I was talking to you about. So either 50p or $0.5, whichever way you are right. So the 100 is not 100%. It is hundred Ghana City, hundred dollars, hundred naira, hundred whatever the heck currency we're using. So it means currently shareholders, this is how much they get. Zero point five dollars per share as they are earnings. But there is a convertible shares in the question. So we want to let ordinary shareholders know what is likely to happen in the future as a result of the convertible shares. So we are going to apply the assumptions. We're going to assume that these guys are going to convert. So what do we do? We slash in our currency sign and bring in the profit for the year. Okay, yeah, pounds. Right, thanks. Profit for the year. I think my stream paused a little. I don't know. What the heck happened? Okay. So let's go. Let's go. So we bring in the interest. So what is the interest here? Stay with me. They said thousand hundred pounds, ten percent loan notes. So the nominal value of the loan notes. It's going to be 1,000 times 100 pounds multiplied by 10%. What do we have? 1,000, 100, 0.1. That's 10,000. So that's the interest we will no longer pay because remember we are assuming that they have converted at the beginning of the year. Okay? They have converted at the beginning of the year. So we less the tax, the tax benefit, which is the 10,000 multiplied by the tax rate, 21%. And that should be 2,100. So now our adjusted profits of the tax which is what we're going to use, it's going to be how much? 500,000 plus that will be 7,900 so 507,900 you see that we are just applying the principle we are just applying the principle okay so now that we have this how about the number of shares so we need to get our wins 
our wins that is weighted average number of equity shares will be the outstanding ordinary shares plus the number of shares to be converted from the convertible loan notes so the potential ordinary shares okay so what is the outstanding shares as we used already here one milli now what how many shares will the equity share uh, convertible loan notes people get we are told that each is going to get 220 ordinary shares so remember it is thousand times hundred pounds okay and each is going to be 20 so divided by 100 times 20 so let's work it out that was the figure we had here the same figure we had here so 1100 by 20 and that's going to be 20,000 so this is 1 million and this is 20,000 like I said, any questions you raise, <laughs> no, raise your hand, but put it in the chat for me. And so that would be 1 million and 20,000. Eh. Like this. So this is our weighted average number of equity shares. Now we have the wins, we have the adjusted earnings. Uh, profit so we can calculate that diluted so our diluted earnings special will be the adjusted 547 900 pounds divided by 1 million and 20,000 so let's see what we get here 507900 1 million and 20,000 Okay so I'm getting no point 9 whatever no point 49 maybe 8 if I want in that regard and that is no point 498 dollars why am I missing currencies pound but we can multiply that by 100 pounds to get our answer in pounds and uh, that will be 49 s in the smallest unit of the currency maybe 49.8p so that is the diluted and in special so we are telling share with it that hey listen right now you are getting 50 pence okay you're getting 50 or 0 0.5 dollars but if these people convert their shares you will get 49.8 and so you can work it out to see the percentage of dilution that will be 0 0.5 minus sorry that will be 50 minus 49.8 divided by 50 times 100 and the dilution is just like 4% in that, no point four percent Not that significant though, but that is the concept about dilution. And you realize that it is reducing their earnings, but not that dramatic because the interest is being added up to the profit. And so, although there is a reduction, the reduction is just minimal. That is the idea about convertible loan notes any questions you put it in the chat for me and i'm going to be providing you with some answers so this is how we deal with diluted and in special when there is convertible loan notes okay when there is convertible loan notes so let's see i'm seeing some comments coming up let's see if i can look at some of them real quick here what do we have sylvester said following prof okay 
blameless said uh, what that's an emoji i think so emmanuela said sir please can you treat revenue from contract workers what is revenue from contract workers what is revenue from contract workers are you talking about revenue from contract with customers because i don't know which one is revenue from contract workers ifrs2 that is share based payment and ias19 employee benefit okay we're gonna see how that will go good evening insurer okay that's daniel yeah good evening um clement said great lecture thank you stella okoli said good evening insurer good evening stella thanks for joining us rachel or uh, saying i'm watching from zambia okay kelvin is saying hi to R rachel so it's like okay you know yourselves all right okay all right so let's move on to the next slide don't have any questions that i have to address so let's move on to the next slide let's look at the second thing when there is share options so number two share options when there is share options what's the implication of that generally on the financial statements it's an interesting area as well but share option largely share option is covered by ifrs2 share based payment but that's not what we're going to do here we're just going to look at it from ias 33 perspective but the idea about share options like i explained earlier is what it says it is it could be given to the employees of the company which means that okay if you work for the company if you work for the company for the next say five years then you have the right to buy some shares in the company now usually the value at which they buy the shares will be lower than the share price at the time they will be buying the shares generally that's where the profit comes in so for instance at the grant date which is the date on which the option is made public and the announcement is made of the share option to the employees that is the grant date at the grant date because it's a share option management will say okay you work for this company for say five years you're going to get buy the shares at whatever twenty dollars per share now suddenly by the end of, on of the fifth year if you run the company well the share may go up by whatever the heck maybe forty dollars per share so the difference becomes your profit that's the idea about share options now share options have no effect on the profit for the year so when it comes to share option and dealing with diluted earnings per share And dealing with diluted earnings per share our profit attributable to equity shareholders will remain the same so no adjustment will be done because it doesn't have any p, p l effect unlike convertible loan notes which had a p l effect so we adjusted a profit and uh, share option it has no p l effect so we wouldn't adjust the numerator in that case then we go to the denominator, which is going to be the weighted average number of equity shares. That will be adjusted because we have to calculate the number of shares in the option and work our way out generally in that regard. Okay. So the headache here is how to calculate the weighted average number of equity shares. So we go with the following steps in the calculation of the weighted average number of equity shares. The first thing we do is to calculate the what we call the percentage of dilution. Okay, the percentage of dilution. The idea about the percentage of dilution is simply that it is going to be the share price minus the exercise price 
the exercise price is how much shareholders sorry employees are going to be paying when they ultimately exercise the option divided by the share price times 100 now there is another way to go about this i'm going to show you the two ways then the one you understand you go with it times 100 so we're going to get our answer in x percent so that's the first thing percentage of dilution then we go to the second one number two and we calculate the number of shares in the options number of shares in the option and the number of shares in the option is simply going to be your percentage of dilution which you calculated in step one multiplied by the share option your percentage of dilution which you calculated in option one multiplied by the share option and then step number three you can now calculate the weighted average number of equity shares which is going to be your outstanding shares throughout the year plus the number of shares in the option which you did in step two number of shares in the option which you did in step two so this is how we calculate the weighted average number of equity shares when there is a share option like i said it has no p l implication so nothing about it will come in the p l account so we're not going to adjust the profit for the year or the purchase figure but in the calculation of the weighted average number of equity shares this is how we go about it but like i said there is another way that we can use to calculate the share option by skipping the step one and step two there's another way to present it uh, so i'm going to show you the two the one that you are comfortable with you stay with it i think you're going to love this one than the second one but you know i'm going to show you the two then you choose whichever the heck you like so that's the idea that's all about share option we're done we're done so let's bring up an illustrative question here and see what we can do so let me pull up my slide again this is also another illustrative question from a document by Deloitte so just using it as an illustrative thing to understand the principle there we go let's zoom it out ABC Limited has 50 employees, each of whom has 5,000 uninvested, unvested share options in a share option scheme. Okay. So there are 50 employees. Each of them have, each of them has 1,000 unvested share options. So maybe we can start with taking some few things. So the share option is actually going to be, let me put it this way, maybe number of options will be the number of employees multiplied by the share option that each of them gets. So that's 50 by 1,000. That's going to be 50,000. So in total, we have 50,000. Let's continue. The excise price of the option is five pounds and the fair value of services still to be rendered by each employee calculated in accordance with IFRS 2 is 1,200. So you gotta be careful here about what the heck is going on because there is an Easter egg here that we need to make sure we understand very well. So the exercise price. So in this question, they said the exercise price of the option is $5. And the fair value of services still to be rendered by each employee calculated in accordance with IFRS 2 is 1,200. So the question we then have to ask ourselves is what is the total exercise price? Because yes, although the price is five, 
there is a value of services that they have not rendered yet. So in case, because we are assuming they are going to exercise the option now and not sometime in the future, we have to include the value of the service that they have not rendered yet in the exercise price. For that reason, the total exercise price It's going to be equal to the normal exercise price plus the remaining as per the IFRS 2 calculation. So the normal exercise price plus the remaining and this is an exclusive question has those things in it that we need to really talk about in that regard so the remaining as per IFRS to charge per share so that's a formula in most questions you will just be given a normal share price without the fact that oh uh, fair value of services still to be rendered Assuming that question is not there, then our total exercise price would have been just the normal, the five, then we go away. But because that is there, and the service is still yet to be rendered, like I said, since we are assuming that they are converting now, then they would have to pay for the service that they have not rendered yet. That is why the exercise price would have to be above the normal. That's the principle. Okay. So we go. The normal exercise price is five pounds. The remaining they said is thousand two. And that is in relation to all the total options. So one thousand two hundred over one thousand generally. And so that's gonna be five pounds plus thousand two. One thousand is one point two pounds. And so in total, we're going to have 6.2 pounds. So this becomes the total exercise price. Get it well. Okay. So we have the number of options to be 50,000. The total exercise price to be 6.2. Let's continue to read and finish. ABC PLC has 1 million ordinary shares in issue. And the average share price for the period was ten dollars. Earnings for the period is five hundred thousand. Okay, it looks like just the same scenario we went with earlier generally. So I'm just gonna duplicate the tax here. So as always, before you calculate your diluted, you must calculate your basic earnings per share. Okay, so this is my basic earnings per share. It's the same thing because it's 500,000 um, pounds and 1 million shares. Now, we have to calculate the weighted average number of equity shares. And like I said, these are the three steps that we will go with generally. So, percentage of dilution, number of shares in the options, and boom, 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 we go away. So, let's go through the three steps to do the calculation. So calculating the weights. So let's first calculate percentage of dilution. You remember the formula, right? We said the share price minus the excise price over the share price times 100. Okay. So you realize that our share price, the average share price is 10 pounds. So 10 minus the total excise price we calculated 6.2 divided by 10 pounds times 100. Let's get our answer coming up here. 10, 6.2, 10, 100. I get 38%. That's the percentage of dilution. Step one. Step two, what did we say? Number of shares in option. So, number of shares. In.
in option. It's going to be the percentage of dilution, 38%, multiplied by the total share options, which is 50,000. And so 0.38 by 50,000. And that gives me an amount of 19,000 shares. So now that we have this, I can calculate my weighted average number of equity shares. And that is going to be equal to the shares outstanding 1 milli plus the number of shares in the option 19,000. And so that becomes 1 million and 19,000. Like this. This is the principle. Now remember, like we said earlier, the share option, it has no implication on profit. So our profit figure is still going to be the same. So our profit is 500,000. So I dilute to then in spare share. It's going to be the 500,000 pounds divided by the weighted average number of equity shares, 1,019,000. So let's see what we get since we are multiplying by 100 pounds to get the answer in the smallest unit of the currency, 500,000. 1,019,000, uh-oh, plenty zeros, times 100, ooh, I'm getting 49 point, maybe zero, maybe 49.1 pence here, 49.1, that is the diluted earnings per share. So again, what are we telling shareholders? We are telling shareholders that your basic earnings per share is this, but now you are seeing your diluted earnings per share as that. So when the employees convert their shares today, you just get 49. So technically here, they are losing about 90 pence in the all nine. Yes, in, in that particular case, when it comes to what is happening here or nine in that regard nine pence in that regard so that is the idea about diluted and in spare share when there is share option when there is share options but like i said there is a way we can still calculate the number of shares in the option so there's an alternative way to calculate the number of shares in the option let me show you that as well and like i said you can decide which one you want to go with generally. I don't want my feet bless out. So number of the shares in the options, this one, we can just calculate it this way using a certain formula. And so what we're going to say is that what we're going to say is that we will bring in the number of options times the exercise price divided by the average price for the period. That's all. Number of options multiplied by the exercise price divided by the average share price for the period. That's it. Now, so in that way, there are 50 employees, if you remember. Each of them gets 1,000. The excise price, we calculated it to be 6.2 divided by 10. You punch that out. It should give you the uh, amounts that we had here in respect of the number of shares in the option. Then we'll get a free shares coming in. So this is the, let me take this to the next slide so that I can have real estate, more real estate to write. Okay. So 
this is going to be the number of shares in the option in terms of the full shares and so that is 50 by 1000 by 6.2 divided by 10 and that is 31,000 now remember remember le let me let me tell you this you know why we are saying percentage of dilution like why are we saying percentage of dilution like i told you in the beginning in share option we are giving the employees the right to buy shares at a price below the current share price that's where the dilution is coming in so that's why we are calculating the percentage of dilution are you getting the picture that's why we are calculating the percentage of dilution because look at the calculation we did here the share price is 10 but they're going to pay 6.2 so technically the company is losing 38 percent of the share price so it means 68 or 62 percent is what they are going to be getting but then the 38 is the free shares that you are going to be getting at the end of the day so when we go with the alternative approach this is 31,000, and that is the number of shares in the option at full shares then the difference between this and the total number of shares will give us the free shares that you are going to be getting generally which was the 19,000 that we have we had so number of free shares which is the percentage of dilution effect 50,000 minus the 31,000 and that gives us 19,000 still so you choose one I mean these are the two ways we can present this you choose one either this approach <laughs> like I said this one looks more like direct straight sort of flow easily rather than this but it's all about understanding the two presentations are acceptable uh, sorry any of the two will be acceptable because you're still going to get your answer but you just have to know what you are calculating for but the first one i would say that is very easy because you get your percentage of dilution multiply it by the share options add it to your outstanding shares boom 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 you get your answer for the period under review so that is also the idea about diluted and inspection any questions you put it in the chat for me any questions you put it in the chat for me so we started here for slide one and then slide two for the calculation of the wanes <coughs> And then slide three, the alternative way the number of shares in the option could be calculated. And then the real issue. So our basic earnings per share is still 50 or 0.5 pounds. Uh, diluted is 0.49 or 49.1 pence in that regard okay so that's the concept about diluted and in spare share these are the principles that you have to understand so what are the key takeaways when there is convertible shares the interest and the tax effect will be taken to adjust the profit for the year or the patterns figure whatever the heck they will calculate our weighted every number of equity shares when there is share options it has no implication on the profit for the year all we would do is to calculate the number of shares in the option and then get our weighted average number of equity shares any other questions for me let's see let's see let's see let's see seeing some other comments coming up generally uh debo said please treat consolidated financial statements okay yeah we'll be looking at consolidation but you can check the channel again the playlist we have videos on consolidation on the channel you can check those videos out covering almost everything and then there is also another podcast session consolidated masterclass podcast session 
again on the channel here on youtube so you just check you see the podcast consolidation masterclass and you see the videos on consolidated financial statements there but we're going to be covering some issues about that as well during our live sessions this semester but like i said you can refer to those videos and start studying and looking at them in that case alan said following okay uh, and that's from facebook all right any other questions for me any other questions for me uh, all right so now we put the pieces together to then solve a full question because now we've looked at the convertible loan notes on its own and we've looked at the share uh, options separately so if I'm seeing a chat coming up. Can we get your timetable? Timetable for our lectures or what? You can send a message on WhatsApp. You can see the number on the banner there. You can send a WhatsApp message about uh, that. And the timetable for our class will be given to you. In that all will be sent to you. And details about our class will be sent to you in that case that's from gerald there so you can send a message on whatsapp you can see the number in the banner there or if i bring the screen up there's a number as well that you're going to be seeing zero five zero one one four nine two nine six and you'll be able to get access to our timetable okay so now let's put the two together by looking at a very complex question and this is a question from ICANN that is Nigeria okay financial reporting Nigeria November 2022 this is a question that was brought where students were required to calculate the earnings per share taking into consideration the fact that there are options in the picture Sorry, there are options in the picture here and there are convertible bonds here and there is also convertible preference shares here. And so the examiner asked students to first rank the potential ordinary shares, which we will get into, and then we should calculate the diluted earnings per share for the year ended 31st December 2020 and that was for seven marks. So this was this was an icon question and we're going to use this as a guinea pig to bring the two principles together however we're going to be doing that on wednesday god willing as we wrap up on the discussion here so i'm going to be wrapping up around here today god willing wednesday same time i'll be coming your way as we continue with the ifrs masterclass and we're going to be opening up on wednesday with this question where we apply the two principles in one single question and see how diluted earnings per share is actually calculated in an examinable environment or question then we apply these principles generally so that's it about that thank you very much for watching those of you with a thumbs up on the video we really appreciate it it really helps us a lot those of you also sharing the video it's really helpful for us because that helps us to reach as many students as possible so god willing wednesday i'll be coming your way at 4 30 p.m as we try to wrap up on the diluted and in spare share and then start uh, or continue with the basic and in spare share because there are also there are a couple of principles that we have to really take into consideration so enjoy the rest of your week and i'll catch you on wednesday at 4 30 p.m as we continue with our discussion stay safe and take care